I hope you can now see the, the very first slide. Um, maybe somebody can give me a quick sign that it's really working. That... Yes, it's working. Yes, it's okay. looking good. Perfect. Good. Um, so after yesterday and, and the day before, we discussed a bit of interactive sessions on Pyron. Um, I now want to give you like a, a broader picture where we see the general workflow management or the uh, simulation workflows heading um, from the perspective of what we experienced um, on the Pyron side. And when we started with Pyron, it was really this idea to go from um, up in thermodynamics or to do up in thermodynamics. So really taking the atomistic structures of the different phases and then having a tool which in the end would allow us to, to calculate the phase diagram. And while we did this and had quite an, a success on, on that side, we now really want to go one step, sorry, one step beyond and really see, okay, where can we use the same principles that we now developed to get from the atomistic structure to the phase diagram and extend them and maybe find a more general basis um, for material science in, in general and where the, the same principles can be applied. And as the most common slide and that we've already seen several times in this workshop is really this kind of multi-scale slide. So we see the starting from, from the um, electronic structure, then the atomistic structures, crystal plasticity, segregation, and so on. We always increase in time scale and also length scale. And that's really what we ultimately try to achieve. And looking at this from a perspective of a PhD student, I hardly see any code which can do more than two of these phases, right? So typically you have one phase, you have an electronic structure code or, or two, like coupling the two, but there's hardly one that can even do just th uh, two, uh, three of, of these uh, patterns. What we see more commonly is really that we have for each of these dimensions or length scales, we need to do, use a totally different code, right? So on the DFT side, on our side, the primarily vast, but you could also use quantum expresso or any other DFT code. And for molecular dynamics, it's commonly uh, LEMS in our community. And then crystal plasticity would be something like Damask. So we really, in the field, really have this challenge of coupling existing codes, right? So you can't, there's not a single multi-scale simulation code, but there's really this challenge. How can we couple the existing codes and, and combine them? And so that's really what we now try to address with, with this Pyron. And when we think about it and think about the challenges that we face when we try to, to couple existing codes, um, I, I want to take a, a step back and really look at it from a perspective of a PhD student. So I think you get a student and you give him the task, okay, write a code which couples the electronic structure code to an MD code and then uses the MD code to calculate results for crystal plasticity, really to have a pipeline connecting the three. And the challenge for the PhD is code not really starts on the conceptual level, but really on this fundamental technical level. So how do I get the source code, right? So maybe the code is freely available, I guess it's now the case for, for most of them, but maybe you also have to just find the site. Maybe there are certain patches that you need to figure out. Um, how do I install the required dependencies? So it's accessing the, the supercomputer, figuring out what, what kind of system is configured there, and then also how to compile the software. And talking a bit more about the compilation, even if you look at codes like VASP, so, so commercial codes, um, they all say, okay, it's, it's easy to compile our code. You just copy the, the make file, rename it, and then you call it make all. There's just one a small issue with this. And this is, you should take the one that most uh, reflects your system most closely, right? So this, it would be nice if it really works, but as a PhD student, commonly I have no idea what reflects my system. And I, I'm pretty sure that the ASP developers can definitely help you to do it. And um, there's definitely support for this. Um, but in particular for the open source projects, you're usually left with reading the, the installation documentation. And just the installation alone, so I looked it up. Um, for VASP, these are 19 pages. For LEMS, there are a lot of different plugins available. In total, you end up at something like 50 pages. And then for Damask, it would be 14 pages. So that's easily um, close to, or let's say, 85 pages that you have to read just to, to get an understanding, okay, what are the requirements? What kind of codes or compilers or, or dependencies do I need to install all the three packages 
on my system, right? So how can I combine them and put them together? And this gets even more complex when we now try to combine even more codes. And so for the students, that's definitely the first challenge, right? So how do I can get compiled, compile the software? And how do I just get started to run it on my system? That's usually already a, a showstopper and many people never even try a new software. They, they just use the software that was already used in the group. And I guess we, we all can agree that that's not the, the most efficient way. Right? So the student should have the ability to at least try different software packages and then find the one that's most um, suitable for, for their problem or, or their challenge. But then in case they already found the code, there, there's even more questions, right? So how do I run the code? What are input templates? You commonly find them on, on the documentation. You also need to learn about the, the queuing system. So how do I submit the code? Um, are there special things I have to take care of? And then the data storage. And I think the data storage one is, is what we found to, to be one of the cases where it's not an issue until it's too late, right? So when you start, you do a few calculations, data storage is always easy. But then when your number of calculation grows, it becomes more difficult. And just to, to show this, I, I want to take you roughly five years back. So when I, I did my master thesis and I looked it up uh, and see how, how did I structure my data there, right? So here you can see, see my folder structure that I used there. I thought that naming folders by, by dates is a good idea and I, I still follow this principle. But then in these folders, I thought I, I want to automate everything. So I wrote small shell scripts. Obviously those shell scripts require very specific environment variables to be set. So there's basically no chance that anybody other than me can execute them or that I could execute them on any other system. There's basically no reputability, even though that was a, the aim that I had initially. And then I wrote um, Excel sheets with the data that I analyzed. And when we look at this, I also, in, in my PhD work, got to see quite a few of different ways how data could be structured, right? So people just naming them by increasing a number. Um, and then in each of these folders, there's a DFT calculation, but you have basically no chance to understand what is really the, the content of the city. So this data storage and data management is really like a big issue um, whenever we come to, to upscaling calculations and, and try to build this kind of larger setups. And that's typically also the case when we want to bridge the different scales. So that's also many people, PhD students in particular, I guess, struggle with managing the data of the calculation and to have them in a, in a reproducible way that they can also share them later um, with like a successor or the next student who's coming after you. And then finally, there's this perspective of, of how to understand the code, right? So what are the units of the input and output? If I in particular can connect different codes, are the units all the same or do different codes have different units? It's very easy to, to make an issue and run a D DFT code with, with like uh, mixing Bohr and Angstrom and you get totally crazy results. Um, what is the convergence behavior and the physical interpretation? So I again look back at the beginning of my PhD, I, I did my first co convergence checks. I looked at energy color, uh, bulk modules over energy color and K points, and I wasn't sure how to do them. Right? So I, I really had to learn this, and it would be great if the tool could already provide this kind of conversion checks. And I see that not I, only I was struggling with this in the beginning, but really, if you look at the literature, you find people who just adopted previous convergence parameters and other settings and just continue using the same settings throughout their whole PhD uh, thesis or so on, right? So we, if you just look at the convergence parameters and how they changed over the thesis, you find many theses where they just remain the same from the very beginning, and most likely they were taken from a previous student. And so this really, if we collect these three points, how to get the code, how to run the code, and how to understand the code, it's basically a very large barrier for new students to try new codes, right? So most of them really remain on the software stack that they used before that's already known to the group. And so everybody stays with what they already knew and there's no, not so much exchange. And I guess that's really what's important now if we want to move on as a community is really trying to connect the different tools, have more sharing of ideas and bring people together and make it very easy for people to use new codes. And then since uh, the last five years, quite a few things changed. And what I want to present today is a bit what I would call like the open software stack. 
Um, so um, Pyron recently joined the NumFocus um, Foundation as an affiliate project, which really tries to push open code for, for better science. Um, they are involved in, in the most general Python packages, so something like NumPy, but also then larger packages. And a few that I want to, to highlight here is this Conda Forge, so that's a package manager um, for the Anaconda system. Pyron, our software that we developed for, for the workflow management, and then Jupyter Notebooks, which I believe is a, the future to move forward in, in terms of managing calculation and to document your workflow rather than doing it on a terminal, really trying to use the Jupyter Notebooks, which is already quite popular in the data science community and also in, in bioinformatics. Good. So the idea really being that we want to come to a standard interface where we can put the, the different codes and the different length scales together like building blocks. Right? So just like you, you may remember Lego from the from your childhood days, maybe you can just put one block on another one. And because they all have a standard interface, it's easy to build very complex structures rather quickly. Good. So talking about Conda Forge, um, the main goal here being that you can, with just a single line, be able to install any software. And we did this for, for the Pyron package. So you can all do Conda install and then see Conda Forge, install Pyron, and you get Pyron but also you get all the dependencies that, that you need to, to, to run a workflow um, with Pyron. And to, to explain it a bit more, so Conda is a package manager. It was developed originally um, to be able to bring the NumPy package or to simplify the installation of the NumPy package um, because it was a bit hard at the time with the classical pip package manager because it needs the, the Blast library and different C libraries um, to run the numerics. And um, Conda supports Linux, Mac OS, and Windows. Um, it's a user level package manager. So you don't need any administrative rights. You get pre compiled binaries. So there's no, no time uh, took for, for compiling the binaries. Um, yeah, originally was developed for, for NumPy packages. And it's widely used in machine learning and also bioinformatics. And my hope would be that, like, let's say in five years from now, people would also mention material science as one community where Conda is widely used. Um, Conda Forge is then the, the community channel as part of the Conda project. There are over 12,000 software packages in there. They have a standardized build infrastructure. So they use GitHub to, to build all the packages for each of these packages. You can see exactly which commands were used um, to, to create it it's openly on, on GitHub. And it's e relatively easy to integrate new packages in there. So there are already templates, how you build a, a repository for your own package to be included in Conda Forge. And this brings up to the question, what is, how many codes are there for material science or what is the status of material science of adopting a package manager like Conda Forge? And if you would have asked this five years ago, there were basically none. And now as part of the Pyron project, we really started to, to push this and we started to submit codes um, to the Conda Forge repository. So all the codes that you see listed here, uh, in total, there are over a hundred. You can find the full list on, on my GitHub account. Um, they are now available. You can install all of them with a simple command, Conda install, C Conda Forge, and then the name of the code. Many of them are primarily available for Linux. Um, that's given that the tutorials or the documentation mainly describes how to install them on Linux. Um, but yeah, in, in general, you should also be able. So, so if somebody wants to work on it and support a different operating system and from the Conda side as possible, I mainly focus on making them available for Linux. And so you find your codes like the DFT codes, so Quantum Expresso, um, Swings, our in-house DFT code. Obviously, we can't create a package for BAS because that's a commercial license, but all the open source codes um, can be made available. Many packages like PyMagen, Iron that I already mentioned, um, Phono3Pi or Phonopi, um, another DFT code, so CP2K, Siesta, um, and then also MD codes like Jaff, um, ModMole, different kind of pseudo -pot uh, potentials for, for the fitting process, so sort of the runner, the neural network potentials, and many more cluster expansion codes like ISET and CLEES. And the other part is where we, we tried for the packages that are available, I like the LAMS package here, we try to include as many plugins as possible. And so we have the OpenKIM plugin, the Moment Tensor Potentials, 
crypt potentials, ACE potentials, neural network potentials to really have like an executable, which is widely usable um, for all different kinds of applications. And it's important to mention that these executables are not as fast if you compile them locally on your HPC cluster. But the idea is really that if you have a Conda executable, it should allow you to try the code, get started, get a feeling, okay, does this code solve my problem? And once you see that the code solves your problem, that is exactly what you have been looking for, then spend the time to compile an optimized version on your system, right? So the, it's really this first step of, okay, I want to try a new code and I want to see if this code is reasonable for, for my, my topic and what I'm interested in. I want to give it a try and this step should be very easy, right? So once I decide, okay, I want to use this code and this is the one that I need, then I can spend the time, compile the code locally and get this, this last bit of performance. To talk about the performance difference, from our experience is roughly a factor two to three. So Conda compiles software package to be, be compatible for um, the last 10 or CPU infrastructure from the last 10 years so that the executable can be executed on all CPUs from the last 10 years. But now if you have a, one of the latest CPUs, you could be a bit faster, which can be like this factor two or three if you compile explicitly optimized for your CPU infrastructure. Good. So we now really have a, a wide range of tools for material science available, um, simulation codes, as, as well as additional tools that you need to, to plug workflows together. And this really now addresses already the, the first point. So it should now be easy to get the code. It's just a single line, and there should be no reason why not to try a different code. Um, so let me focus on, on the, the other two aspects. So how to run the code and then how to, to understand the output. And that's really what we we try to achieve with Pyron. So once the, the code is installed, what we try to do is to separate the part that's required from the user from the, from the technical implementation part. So let's say the user, maybe we can do it for the example of fitting a new interatomic potential. The user might have an idea. Maybe I want to, this could be the shape of the potential, what I, I want to try my, my project. And I need to define a model here. Then from this model, I define a project. The project would be okay, what are, the kind of calculations I want to execute. And I define these calculations in terms of like a generic input. So what kind of structures do I want to calculate? What kind of convergent parameters and, and so on. And then the software tool should really take this generic input, which is code independent, translate it to a code specific input. So in the simplest file case, writing the input file, call the executable to run the simulation, after the simulation finished successfully and um, pass the output of the simulation, again, get some kind of generic output format, which ideally again should be code independent and then apply certain job validations, right? So that could be, is a, for a DFT code, did you reach electronic convergence or did you stop because you reached the maximum number of steps if it's like a complex structure um, and, and other validations that could be automatically done are done here, then we collect the data. So this would be now combining multiple um, calculation in like one Pandas data frame or another Python object, do some analysis on the combined data, and then finally have some, some visualization. And at the visualization stage, that's where the user takes over again and says, okay, does this match with my what, what I expected? Or do I have to adjust the model again and do another iteration? And we try to represent this on, on the Pyron side um, by each Pyron object basically having a user interface. So the user is only interfacing with, with the Pyron object by a Python interface. And then also we have resources and data storage. So for the user interface, we try to use um, yeah, some kind of advanced Python options that Python offers. So we have operator overloading, so you can add two Pyron objects together just to we try really to make it feel as natural as other Python objects. So if you're already familiar with NumPy, um, it should be very easy to, to get started with Pyron. Um, also factoring so that you can use one object to create other objects of other classes. Um, this might sound a bit abstract now. I will show an, an example in a, in a few seconds. Um, yeah, then the Pyron object, it can also have other objects nested in them. Um, it can also be connected to, to resources. So this could be your computer cluster, so then the Pyron object communicates with us. There's no need for the user to 
leave the Jupyter Notebook to submit the calculation, but it can all be done from within the Jupyter Notebook. And you directly have access to parameter databases, for example, a database of, of interatomic potentials and access to the specialized codes. So this could be the DFT code, which different versions are available. Um, did you compile maybe multiple versions with certain patches and, and so on. And then the, the third part is really the data storage. And we really try to hide this from the user, but what Pioneer uses in the background is an HDF5 file format, so a hierarchical file format to store the data. The advantage there being that it works very nicely with NumPy. We can store large arrays in a compressed format from memory directly into the files, and then read only the segment where this one array was stored in a compressed way back into memory and only decompress it on the memory side. So that's very efficient. Um, and when you try to store large trajectories, the HDF file formula is so far the, the fastest one that we found. In addition, we use an SQL table to track the, the status of the different Pyron objects. So, so is an object currently running? Maybe the, the calculation is still running. Maybe you're waiting in the queuing system. It can be easily accessed from, from an SQL table. And then well, what we use is some kind of serialization. So you can use a Pyron object save it to its HDF5 file, send this HDF5 file to a different computing cluster, and load the object from the HDF5 file, you get exactly the same state of an object that you had before. Right? So it's really like freezing the object in, transferring it via the HDF5 file to some other system, and then extracting it there again to continue the calculation. Good. And the, the goal really, and that's what we try to highlight here, is really hiding the technical complexity. All right, so the user should really focus on the physics and the, the task there and the, all the technical part of submitting the job or the data storage should be completely hidden from them. And then how does it look like from a for, for user perspective? So this is now a typical screenshot. So we use JupyterLab as a user interface. And you can see I still name my folders by, by date. So these are now a different projects that I do. Um, with the Jupyter Lab, we use the NGL view package to directly look at structures um, in the browser. This can help to identify if you maybe place two atoms too close to each other, that would result in a calculation which converges only very slowly, and you can already see it if you just visualize a structure. In addition, you can use Markdown to um, yeah, write some documentation, maybe add a table of contents for your Jupyter notebook. You can have the code in there, as well as um, comments in the code. And then also have the graphics and then all this basically in, in one document and right? so the the goal really is there to have one document which was used to how you set up the calculation how you submit the calculation and then also how you analyze the calculation there's really self-contained and it's just one file and not like we saw it before with the excel files and so on and nobody knows which calculation are now connected to which data analysis and so on and so the, the goal would be that at some point, and we're not yet fully there, but you can click on a picture and it tells you, okay, to get this data point, I use the following calculation um, to achieve this. Good. I'm talking a bit about the code. So those of you who participated in the previous two sessions, um, I guess already know this. I will just very briefly uh, show a few highlights. Um, Pyron is really designed to be for um, or to be used in this kind of interactive setting. So really the Jupyter notebooks, so we use a lot of auto-completion, try to have as, as few variables um, that the user has to remember. And this already starts by with having just one import statement, right? So you only need to import the project object from Pyron, and then all the other objects can be created from this one class. So just a single import statement. We then create the project. The project can be thought of like a folder, you can then use the project object in a factoring pattern. So we use project object here to create a job object. So in this case, a lens calculation. Again, wherever there's a dot, I can just use tab completion to get the selection of values that I can choose from. And I give my a job name. So this I get a job object. And then the same applies to access um, the ASE library and, and get the a bulk structure from, from ASE to be used as a structure for our calculation. Um, Pyron also interfaces to, to resource databases. So in this case, it's, it's a lens calculation. So we want an interatomic potential. Um, so we access the NIST database and the OpenKIM database. Or more particular, we already have them stored. So they provide now a conda package where all the potentials are included. 
and you can get a, a full list of the potentials and then you can either copy just the name of the potential or say I just want the, the first entry from this list. Right? So it's very easy to access the database. Previously, this would mean, okay, you have to search on the web, download the file, figure out again, okay, what are the commands to load the file for a specific code? You have to change something in my input scripts. Now it's as easy as just selecting the name of the potential that you want. And we can also switch to, to parallel execution. So if you have an, if your code supports MPI, you can just increase the number of cores and switch to, to, to the code to be running run in parallel. The same goes for the queuing system. So you could the job every job object has a server part, and then you could specify a queue, a runtime, memory limits, and so on. And then finally, you can easily submit it just calling the run method. And we provide already a large set of defaults um, to, to start your calculations so that you only, in this case, it would be just a static calculation of the Spark structure. Um, and then we automatically take care of all the storage and, and data parts. So if you execute the same steps again, instead of running the calculation again, it would just reload the calculation and say, okay, I already did this calculation. Here's the result. So what I, I try to highlight here is really that when developing Pyme, we, we try to design it for this interactive development, try to design it ex explicitly for, for the Jupyter Notebooks and, and Jupyter Lab, and try for every class to really have a, a representation um, that works nicely with the Jupyter Notebooks and, and Jupyter Lab. Good. Um, going a bit beyond this, um, we can also implement new codes. So it gets a bit more complicated, but in principle, all you need is a write input and a collect output function. And we implement a template job class and derive our new toy job here from this template class. We define an input, and in this case, that the toy job just has a single input, but this could be more complex. You could define the default values here. We can define an executable. Here, I just call the shell command cat on the input file and pass it over to the output file. We have a script to write this input file and then a script to, to collect the output, read all the lines, convert it again into a float and store it in the HDF5 file. So if you want to implement a new code in Pyron, all you need to do is have a way. We give you a dictionary of input values, how to write these dictionaries into the specific code specific input files. And then if you get a directory with output files, how to pass these output files to get back a dictionary, which can then be stored in the HDF file. So we really try to make it as easy as possible. And we always recommend to start with a, just a single application. So if you, let's say you want to do a minimization, start by only implementing the implement minimization and then move on from there, always adding functionality of the underlying code as it's needed. Right? So it makes no sense to start to already write the perfect parser and try to take account for, for all the edge cases. Uh, it's much easier if you know the kind of input that you've written, what kind of output you expect during the parse. Um, yeah, so you can write just an write input function and a collect output function, and it should be easy to integrate new codes in, in Python. Good. Um, one other example of where we really found this useful is now, okay, if I have a new topic and I read maybe a new paper or a, want to learn about a new field. And in our case, it would, it was we were interested in learning more about potential fitting, or in particular, the more modern machine learning potentials, and if they can help us um, to go towards the phase diagram calculations. So the ideal goal would be that we have a database of atomistic structures. We try not only one, but multiple fitting codes, and then we validate them and see, OK, how can the different codes, do they all agree in their validation part, or are there differences from the same data set and, and what can we learn there? And if you do this, you easily find, okay, there are basically two parts to a potential fitting. So there's a choice of descriptors and that can be very hard, right? To do, how do you describe that to uh, environment in a way that it's uh, still um, consists of symmetries so that you have a, an easy descriptors, um, but it, yeah, covers the whole complexity. And then the second part is really how do you then you use a fitting procedures? So those can be neural networks, um, Gaussian processes or linear regression or other fitting procedures, which are available in most of your common um, yeah, scientific computing packages. 
and to, to fit these descriptors to energies and forces. And so in particular, as, as we realize the similarity, right? So that there's only a, a given set of, of the descriptors and then there are certain fitting methods. We thought, okay, it would be very nice to be able to compare now different fitting codes, do a quick implementation of those fitting codes inside Pyron, and then try them on the same data set and try also to use in the resulting potentials to do the same validation methods, right? So how good are they trained on the same data set? And we did this as part of the, the potentials work group. So that's a, a DFG project. Um, and we recently did it in a, a workshop. The workshop consisted of like three days, three hours of interactive tutorials. And then we had additional talks. The first day really covering how to create structures, how to build up this, this database. The second day being different fitting codes. So in the three hours, we, we taught them three different fitting codes and the third day being the validation. And I don't want to go too much into the details of fitting potentials. I guess it's, as I said, a, a separate workshop and not the, the topic here. Um, we were able to put them all in there. We were able to compare them and really had a, a nice discussion on this. What is, I guess, more important in the scope of this workshop is really how long did it take us to, to, to get there? So what is the, the time it takes to implement new codes and, and really build this kind of full scale, yeah, rapid prototyping understanding of, of a new field? And when I look back, so we started the, the repository, we created an empty repository on the 22nd of January. It took us a whole month to create the Conda packages uh, until we really got the, the executables running and, and all this to get used to the code, talk to the expert, talk about what kind of data set we want to analyze and so on. Afterwards, it, it took only a few days to, to write the Python wrappers, a few more days to write the Jupyter notebooks for the tutorials, and we were able to have the workshop then from the 10th to the 12th of March. So while this previously might have thought, uh, taken over half a year, we're now really down to something like less than three months, right? So we're more in the area of one and a half months in, in just in the preparation of implementing three different fitting codes and getting all the executables imported and, and the LAMP support. And that's really where we think that the, the big value of Pyron is with the, the rapid prototype, right? So this idea of, okay, you have a new field, you have a new idea, you want to compare different codes, it should be easy to, to implement them and to really have like a shared platform to, to work on. And potential fitting here really is, is just one example and there, there are many more um, that might be interesting. To give one other example, and this may be in a, in a different direction, so the University of Ghent used Pyron um, for, for their courses. So in the tutorials, they wanted to teach their students methods going from Hartree-Fock over density function theory, um, and then classical force fields, molecular dynamics, Monte Carlo, and so on. They're more interested in molecules. So we are more on the, on the solid state side. They were more interested in molecules. So they implemented new codes for the lecture, starting with Gaussian, JAF, and QuickFF. And while well, we were very happy about their feedback because they really said, okay, with Pyron, they were able to focus on the physics and not so much on the technical part. And if you think about this in, in terms of like the lecture setting, you have students that maybe never used the terminal in an extensive way, that never really worked on a kind of larger data analysis. So having a tool and they just having to focus on the Jupyter notebook really simplified this, this lecture part and, and made it a more, more, lot more accessible for the students and they learned more. So that's also another application we want to highlight, just how Pyron can be used for lectures and, and student exercise. Good. Um, the last few minutes, I want to briefly talk about the Pyron community. So we are an uh, open source project. You can find us on GitHub, Pyron slash Pyron. The development started at the MPAE uh, in Düsseldorf. It was then joined by, by ICAMS from Bochum, um, a group from Darmstadt. And now we are more recently going international. So people in Los Alamos are contributing, University of Leoben, Skoltech, British Columbia, and the Center for Molecular Modeling, so that's the University of Ghent. Um, we're not as big as other projects, but we're continuously growing, and um, yeah, we're very open for, for new contributors. Um, what we used Pyron originally for was really this idea to go from DFT calculations to the phase diagram. When you look at the numbers to 10 to the power of six or seven configurations, each taking a few hours, that's not possible in, in like not even a PhD thesis. 
So that's not a possible route. What we did instead, we used interatomic potentials and then the fitting and the, the quick calculations to, to evaluate these structures with the same precision. Um, that was really where we originally implemented Pyron 4. Um, maybe I jump now a little bit. So we have a bit more time for discussion as well. Uh, there's one more slide I would like to show. Yeah. Okay, so, so I go, go to this point. Um, the, the goal here really being, well, how can you then, if you, if you have done your workflow with Pyron and you have created the Jupyter Notebook, how can we then publish it? Um, what we implement is very, very high level interface for, for, two, for people who don't want to understand the physics. For example, uh, if you think about melting point calculations, they only give us the potential file and a small JSON file describing everything. Then we have a framework which can execute the Jupyter Notebook, which contains all the physics. It uses Pyron internally to, to run the data and uses Conda to install the dependencies. And then the more advanced user can really start on, on the Jupyter Notebook level, work on the physics side without having to take care of the, the technical implementation. Um, so that's really the, the goal that we really try to establish the Jupyter Notebooks in combination of the Conda environment as like a way to, to publish uh, workflows. And, and to, we see it really as a way forward, right? And this can be done with Pyron and Pyron is really designed to do it, but you can also publish Jupyter Notebooks and Conda environments for, for any other kind of workflow um, software. And then more recently, and this is what I guess is, is current work in progress, um, we joined the Materials Digital project. So there's a German project um, where we try really to bring workflows also to industry. And this is where we work on this larger scale. So one is coupling lamps um, to Damask by calculating the elastic constant for an interatomic potential and then using these elastic constant independent on, uh, depending on concentration um, for a crystal plasticity calculation and also on the fly TM analysis. So while as a human, we have a hard time to see the patterns here. If we on the fly apply SciPy and advanced filters, we can identify the, the patterns. And then basically the, the goal there is that we can tell the machine to focus on the, the area of interest and doing a rough scan first and then really highlight the parts which are um, yeah, more of interest. And that's really where we, we see the, the next steps in going beyond just atomistic simulation connecting to larger scales and even connecting to experimental application. Um, yes. And obviously that was not only me, there were many people involved. I'm very grateful for the support from Jörg Neugebauer who gave me the opportunity to work on this project. Um, there are many Pyre and core developers. We are thankful for the funding um, and it continues to being extended. Um, so I showed here a bit of the initial thermodynamics part, high throughput calculation, um, machine learning potentials and student exercises and more collaborators. And with this, I guess I, I close it here. So we developed Pyron with a goal to, or which allows us now to implement complex workflows. And we can then show that from these complex workflows, we can really gain new physical interest, uh, insights, right? So to, the goal is not in the end to have very complex workflows, but really to use these complex workflows to understand new physics. And I guess with this, I close the presentation and I have some time left for questions, I guess.